Hi guys, it's Claire. Welcome back. So last December over Christmas break, I filmed a discussion video with my older brother, Sam, talking about some of the books that I have recommended to him over the years and that he has subsequently read. And at the time I thought it was going to be a kind of fun, light video. But then when I went to go edit it, I kind of started having second thoughts and was like, I don't know if this is that interesting. It's kind of long and rambly and a little bit awkward. And so I kind of set it aside and forgot about it and then was looking at it recently with some fresh eyes. And I feel like it's like interesting enough. And we also did talk about a number of books that I would categorize as favorites of mine. And so I finally finished editing it and thought I would release it from the vault with the caveat that I am definitely the most like annoying and loudest version of myself with immediate family, unconditional love. And so with that kind of lengthy intro out of the way, please enjoy this chatty discussion video from pre-COVID times. Hi guys, it's Claire. Welcome back. Today I thought I would switch things up a little bit and I'm joined by a special guest, my brother Sam, who's the first ever guest on this channel. First of all, if you want to say a little bit about yourself and what kind of reader you are. Okay. I don't want to say anything about myself, but what kind of reader am I? Yeah. Mm, I think that we read relatively similar things. Lots of literary fiction. I probably read more, more weird stuff than you, maybe. I think you read more classics. Do I? Maybe. Probably but, read more male authors. Well, yeah, I was going to say, so like a lot more Haruki Murakami, a lot more Salman Rushdie than you have ever touched. I would say Sam's more of a snob than I am. I sometimes I'm read a, snob. a book and I'm like, oh, this is so good. And Sam's like, it was fine. <laughs> okay. So I thought I would have Sam on the channel because over the past couple of years, you've read several books that I've recommended slash told you to read, right? That's one way to put it. Yeah, well, I made a list. <laughs> I thought we would start with one of the most recent recommendations of mine that you've read, which was a true novel by Minae Mizumura. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, which uh, is a Japanese yes. retelling of Wuthering Heights set post-World War II in Japan. I actually liked a true novel for you the did. most part. Yeah, yeah. overall. Um, Once you get past, it's like an, oh, I have it here. Well, uh, oh. Yeah, oh, oh here it is. So there's a 150 page prologue. Well, right. So it's So this is the prologue and then here's the rest of the book. Well, and it's not just that there's a prologue. There's really like three different parts of you this, You don't right? get into the Wuthering Heights part of the book until like 300 pages in, if right. I'm remembering right. right. So yeah. there's, right, there's like this prologue where the narrator, who is also Minae Mizumura, but you know, not the real one, I guess, yeah. um, is like narrating her life in Long Island and then she hears this story from this kid which is basically like the Wuthering Heights part but then there's like a frame of third That's person an narration. That's novel which is a type of Japanese storytelling like I hadn't heard of it before I'd read this book. Right so there's like this I novel prologue and then there's like this third person narration frame and then there's like the actual like Wuthering Heights retelling, which is like another character talking in first person. Yeah. So like, and not just because of the narrative perspectives, but there's like very noticeable, like kind of texture of the narration differences between those three parts. So like, I didn't like the prologue. Yeah. I, really I liked, liked the prologue because it felt like almost like a great Gatsby type, like story about Taro Azuma, who's the Heathcliff character, but it almost reads like a great Gatsby. I don't know if it's just because it's like in Long Island, but yeah. like American dream, whatever. Yeah. Um, whereas like, I think the part that I liked the most was the like kind of the third person narration frame. Like there's this very clear like change in kind of how the narrative style goes. And it's like, oh yeah, okay, I like this. This is a lot more like kind of interesting and detailed. Like the whole first part is very like sort of, flat and understated um yeah i don't know it was just it was like kind of structurally yeah. interesting or something yeah one thing i was going to say that i like about a true novel is that it really explores like the nelly dean character from wuthering heights which in this book is fumiko did you enjoy that part of the book well so this is where it's unfortunate that it's been a very long time since i read wuthering heights because i do not remember any of the characters other than Heathcliff. So Nellie Dean, I've reread Wuthering Heights is. a couple of times and I feel like if the third time I read it, when you read it, you're like, oh, there's something probably going on between Nellie Dean and Hindley, who's like the alcoholic older brother who like abuses Heathcliff. I see. 
or I that was like subtext that I found where I was just like Nellie Dean's a little too like involved in all of these people's lives and a little too like you know anyway so I think there's like some implications of like her and Hindley and then this book explores the like maybe her and Heathcliff the Taro character spoiler yeah. alert sorry but I was also gonna say so we've also read another Mizomora book about the fall it called the fall of language in the age of English where she talks about kind of the um, rise of English and its implications on the Japanese language and other local languages and it's like <laughs> it's kind of this like polemic a little bit about like anti-globalism and also she's just like all contemporary Japanese literature is like bad so I was gonna say do you think this is like high art uh or do you think she like she um meets her own high standards for contemporary Japanese literature well I mean if she's comparing herself to like Soseki then no, no. <laughs> like not even close but um she gave it a good effort though. Yeah. Okay, cool. On to the next one. <laughs> In keeping with the Bronte theme, I thought the next book we could talk about briefly is Villette by Charlotte Bronte, which is one of my favorite books of all time. And unfortunately, Sam doesn't remember anything about it. So. Well, I remember her getting to the city of Villette. Yeah, which is Brussels. Getting lost as hell on her way to whatever the school was that she yeah. was going to. And that whole thing being like very stressful and. Like, I remember that very clearly. Um, yeah, so that's not, like, a hugely important part of the book. But nope. basically, <laughs> it's a book about, like, a woman who kind of doesn't really have much family. Her name's Lucy Snow. And she goes from England to Villette, which is a stand-in for Brussels, to teach um, at a Catholic girls' school. And then kind of, you know, she, like, meets a couple guys along the way and also has, like, a mental breakdown and... Possibly you know. goes on an opium Possibly goes on adventure an opium through trip. a yeah. is it a festival affair or something like yeah, that. Yeah, when she meets a sphinx. So, um, but I love this book because it's a really great book about unrequited love. Do you remember that part well, of the book? Yeah. 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 No, yeah, now it's coming back. There were two different guys. There right were two there. different guys. There was like the the like the doctor. doctor. That's yeah. it, yes. Doctor John. Yes, and then there was like the angry little French man. Yeah. Yeah, but also um, it kind of touches on mental health too because she kind of goes through these like depressive episodes and describes it really beautifully and kind of in a way that feels ahead of its time. And then she is very like anti-continental. It's not a very tolerant book. It's very anti-continental oh, yeah. people. <laughs> she like goes on these rants about like the continental French girl she has to teach. And then she yeah, also there's, hates there's Catholicism. Whole, right. There's a whole section at the end where it's like a... 80 page rant against like Catholicism but then it's like when she hits rock bottom is when she has to go to a priest for help and yeah. she's like I literally cannot sink lower than I am right oh, that's now right doesn't she like I'm wander counsel from a priest she, she's like, like going she's having like a mental and... breakdown and she's like wandering through the streets it's like during the summer holiday or yeah, something yeah, yeah. and then she goes to a priest and she's like I literally could not get lower than this so good book yeah, it was good. So next I wanted to talk a little bit about The Idiot by Elif Bottomen because I think that's like a latter-day Villette where it has a very passive protagonist who's just kind of going through the world trying to figure it out and also dealing with a lot of unrequited love. And I loved this book. And Sam didn't like it because he said it reminded him too much of a girl that he used to know. And I was like, does that make you an Yvonne? Because most people online are like, Yvonne is trash. The fact that I didn't like it is not um, not an indictment of the book itself, mm. but rather like not being into the main character at all. Like didn't you, you think said, she was funny? Her not sense of really. humor was so dry. Yeah, it wasn't. You didn't into like it. it? Not really. Oh, it just like 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 you said. This was like almost a perfect like facsimile of someone I knew in college. <laughs> so on the one hand, it's like, okay, I mean, as a sort of character study, this is like actually very good. On the other hand, I don't particularly like this character, so I wasn't that into the book itself. But... It was so good. I don't know. I loved it. I, but yeah. I thought it was so funny and just like so perceptive about just kind of like going through the world and like what's happening to me, especially when you're like first in college and like you're like, what's going on? Yeah, that's where like I was just like, get your shit together, girl. Yeah, I recommended this book to my friend who 
like studies Russian and linguistics. And I was like, oh my God, that's what she talks about in this book. You'll love it. And then he read it and was like, I hated it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I forgot you were like an A student and never pined over anyone in your life. <laughs> Moving on. I want to talk about um, the Neapolitan novels by Elena Ferrante, ah, which you've read, right? Yes, this has been a while, but the left has a good impression. It has been probably like two or three years. Fun fact is that I actually started this channel because I initially thought I wanted to like talk about the Neapolitan novels, mm -hmm. and to this day I have not done a review of them. Mm -hmm. And I'm at the point now where I'm like, should I just reread them? Because like, maybe I don't know, I've drafted, I've like taken notes, and I just haven't gotten, I haven't, it's my white whale. I, mean, I haven't gotten to it. That but. would be a big project. I know, I have like 10 pages of notes for it. I like a year ago went through all of the books and like all my underlines and annotations and was like working on it and then I just got defeated by it. So would you say these are like literary masterpieces? Probably. Yeah, okay, that's a high praise from Sam because he's always like meh. I mean, they're like, they're also kind of teed up perfectly for me because what I do like are things that are very kind of focused on a few characters and that really get into sort of the all of their kind of inner details and things like that um yeah but also it's very expansive there are a lot well, of characters right there are a lot of characters it spans a very long stretch of time so like part of what's interesting about them for me is like i read things like a hundred years of solitude or east of eden and I was never, like, particularly into those, like, kind of big multi-generational, like, big cast books, which these kind of look like. Yeah, totally. On a surface, and yet, like, I really liked the Neapolitan novels and felt much more, like, you get into the meat of all of these different characters instead of just having these little, like, cartoons sort of flip by for 50 yeah. pages or something like that. So, yeah, I mean, there must be something in kind of the writing itself or the things that Ferrante, like, focuses on um, that make them all much more kind of real and tangible than in a lot of those other books. And not, like, archetypes either. Like, right. at first they seem like they might be archetypes, but I like what she captures about it are the ways in which people, especially if you grow up in like a kind of smaller, like more insular community, like this Neapolitan neighborhood that the two main characters grow up in. There are these people who are kind of embedded in your life, but then you can go away. And I think she captures accurately the way that people can come back into your life in a way where it's like, there are maybe years that go by where they're not part of it. And I think that's very realistic. And then they come back in like big ways or small that yeah. I think is interesting and kind of accurate but i think she also she also captures like change and how people change so that they're still recognizable but they can also like if you haven't seen someone for 10 years they're going to be different but she captures that in ways that i think feel very real and kind of prevent the characters from feeling like total archetypes who kind of fall into the patterns you would expect them to fall in like i think every character in the book kind of shifts and changes in ways that you wouldn't totally expect. Like even the Solara right. brothers who are kind of the like mafia or like Gamora, like Kimura, like brothers aren't what you would expect necessarily. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you don't even realize. You don't even realize that's like what's, it's kind of like this like more expansive world of like the Godfather. I always try and like yeah. tell, like I told dad to read these books, which he's like never going to, yeah, because I'm like, it's like the Godfather, but like with women. Uh, but it's kind of this like expansive like world and there's kind of all this stuff going on and you don't even notice that it's happening because it's so just like the world that like these young girls, you kind of accept as the constant as they grow older you also as they're growing older like learn how to contextualize their world within the broader history of like italy and the 21st century and europe and stuff like that and i think she just captures like that expanding consciousness in a way that like it's it simulates for you the reader also do yeah. you know what i mean yeah like the books get more political as they go on you get this broader picture of like history and naples and what i like about them too is like this whole like push pull it's always like this is a book about female friendship which like ugh, okay but um it's kind of just this really intense <laughs> relationship between yeah. these two girls and it's also about like creation and like storytelling where this idea of like authorship like um like Lenu, like elena like writes the books and is like this writer creative but she always is feeling guilty by the ways in which she steals stuff from lena i don't know i think the book is like a great testament to the fact that so much of storytelling and writing is this like collective 
thing, but even if you are like the one author and you're pulling from all of these other things and you're influenced by all these other things and I don't know, mm -hmm. which then is even more poetic because you don't know who Elena Ferrante is if you haven't read that article. <laughs> I mean, we know who she is, but it's fine. <laughs> even though she's not from Naples. We're not going to talk about it. But, but do you know what I mean? I think it's like, the, like, I'm not articulating this well, but there's this like collective kind of storytelling in the book. This is why I need to do a review of it because Maybe. I have this idea in my head, but I can't like articulate it. Those books are great. And you've also read The Days of Abandonment, right? Yes, and Ties. And Ties, well. which <laughs> if you don't want to know who Elena Ferrante is, just ignore this part. But those books tell very similar stories, eerily similar stories. There's an, a New Yorker article about it if you want to read more. I mean, if you um, read both of them. Which one did you like better? Oh, the days, the days of, of abandonment. abandonment. Yeah, it's kind of like a modern day yellow wallpaper where this woman's husband like leaves her or is having an affair, and then she's stuck at home with the two kids in their apartment in Turin or something, Doesn't and the dog, and she kind of like is having a mental breakdown in the apartment and trying to keep it together. But there's also something to do with like an ant infestation. And when I was reading the book, oh. I got an ant infestation in my apartment, and I was like, "Am I losing?" That's a sign. <laughs> the days of abandonment is. Like, it is a rough read. Yeah, it's like, tough. It's not, like, fun. It, I mean, it is, like, kind of a little domestic horror story. Next up, I wanted to talk about one of my other favorite authors, which is Joan Didion. And I've read Joan. much of Joan Didion's nonfiction. You've read Slouching Towards Bethlehem and right. The Year of Magical Thinking. Right. Those were the first two Joan Didion books I read. Which one did you read first? Um, I read Slouching Towards Bethlehem first. Okay, so this you is... read it in chronological order. Sure, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. This is right. And Slouching Towards Bethlehem was like a few years ago. The only thing that I really remember is like that essay about San Francisco. Yeah. During the whatever, the 60s, the 60s. 1969. Yeah. yeah. The hippies on Hate Ashbury and yeah. like, you know, all these ragamuffin like 15 year olds who like run away from home and yeah. end up in SF and then have to yeah. figure out what on earth they're She's doing. She's pretty themselves. critical of them. I mean,. Yeah. Joan Didion does get flack for being, like, she's very kind of, like, upper middle class, like, condescending and, like, removed. And I she mean, just kind of judges people from afar. I, I wouldn't, yeah. Right? I mean, I would describe her as being, like, an upper crust. Upper crust. Oh, okay. Elite. She is a coastal <laughs> Yeah, elite. no, I mean, she she's, completely oh, is. Okay, so I read is... her book South and West, which is, like, mostly her notes on a trip to the South that she took in the 70s. And I texted a friend afterwards. I'm like, Joan Didion is literally the platonic ideal of a coastal elite, where yes. she just is completely <laughs> dismissive of, like, everything else, but also, like, roasts people in such like a sharp and just like, oh, where you're like, that is so elitist, but also like really good. Like, yeah. <laughs> like really Might elitist, well but like really it. like spot on. Yeah. And also she's not apologetic about it, which you're like, okay, like good thing you were writing 40 years ago, yeah. <laughs> but. But I mean, also she's, she's originally from Sacramento. Sacramento, right? yeah. Which is not. Um... As we, we just watched Lady Bird. It's the Midwest right. of which California. Opens with a Joan Didion quote. Opens with a Joan Didion quote, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean... But she is, I think, more like upper crust Sacramento society, too. Maybe. You should read know. her book. She has a book, Where I Was From, about California that talks about, like, her childhood in Sacramento. And how, like, her family was, like, originally, like, came across, like, with the Donner Party, but then, like, split ways with them. So she's, like, before obsessed with California. Before cannibalism? Or yeah, obviously before the cannibalism. <laughs> like, hello. But then you also read The Year of Magical Thinking, which right. is very different because Joan Didion does, is, like, often described as being, like, very cold and a little bit remote and, like, keeping the reader at arm's length. And The Year of Magical Thinking is still like that, but for her is, like, much more opening a vein, more vulnerability. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and she, yeah. like, is critical of kind of people around her, but also of herself, too. She does not escape her own, like, detective's eye. We had a conversation with our mom about this because she read it for her book club. <laughs> because she read it with her book club a couple of months ago, and I was like, oh, what'd you think about it? And she said, oh, it was well written, but, like, what did she think was going to happen? And I was like, that book is about her husband dying of a heart attack at, like, 71. And mom was like, what'd she think was going to happen? He had heart problems. And I was like, harsh. Then she clarified that she did like it, but she was also like, only an elitist could have written this. And I was like, 
<laughs> okay. Like, I read that book thinking that he was, like, 50 or something like that. And this, this was, like, a life cut relatively short, which probably shouldn't change your right. interpretation of it too much. I guess really what that is saying is, like, you... If you die over the age of 70, no one should be sad about it or well, write a book about no. it. <laughs> but what I was going to say is that perhaps the book does a good job of um, making you feel the suddenness and absurdness of the loss yeah in such a way that you do whatever mental gymnastics you need to to kind of like mold the situation into something where you're like ah yes if he's like x age or whatever then i can understand why this would be such like a horrible shaking right but i mean part event. of it is that like they had been married for like 40 years yeah. so then and it's like yeah he had <sighs> heart problems and yeah he was 71 71 isn't like old old but no i think what it captures is like that sense of like death is inevitable it's something that's coming for everyone especially if you're old but then i think she does like you said she captures like the fact that I think culturally also we like accept death. It's like, oh, like in a week you have to be over it and move on with your life, da, da, da. Especially if like you're older and like you should have seen it coming. But it's like death is like actually this kind of like ludicrous thing or like the sudden absence of someone, like the permanent absence of someone is so hard to wrap your head around. And so I thought she captured really well kind of that experience where even though you should maybe be prepared for it, you can't prepare for it. Yeah. We have two more to talk about. Two more. We're not going to talk about Pachinko? Do you want to talk about Pachinko? It sucked. The end. <laughs> I got Sam Pachinko for Christmas and then I saw it in his donation pile like a couple weeks later and I was like, oh, along with the idiot. <laughs> I thought Pachinko was, I loved the first half so much that I think I'd forgotten that the second half was maybe not as strong. It's not good. This is where, when I said Sam is a snob. <sighs> Okay, do you have any, like, qualifying, like, consolation words for Pachinko? Anything good about it? It's a page turner. I will give it that. Yeah. It is very quick to blast through. And it's, like, 500 pages. It, like, it is one of those, like, multi-generational books that I am, like, not primed to like. Where, like, you have all these characters that show up for, like, 50 pages and then, like, disappear. So it's, like, the opposite of what you like about Elena Ferrante. Right, right. Fair enough. On to someone you like better. There Eileen we go. Chang. So you've read Half a Lifelong Romance and Love in a Fallen City. Yes. Love in a Fallen City is a book of short stories. Right. So I have to say, I loved Half a Lifelong Romance when I read it. I wrote so many broken hearts in the margins. Did you borrow my copy? Yeah, I think Did I, you I saw them? all yeah. broken hearts. But, wow. Well, but, um... Rip. <laughs> Yeah, but I loved it. But I think like as time has gone on, last year I said it was my favorite book of the year. Mm -hmm. But I think if I had to go back and reorder them, I would. Oh, because really? it hasn't like stayed with me as much as I thought it would. Interesting. Like I think I would probably recommend like Love in a Fallen City over Half a Lifelong Romance maybe. Interesting. Maybe okay. I just need to go back and reread it. Yeah, it's... The end is like a killer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean it... I it think that's It takes a while why... to get going. It does yeah. take... Like, kind of the opening romance yeah, is, like, a little... It's fine. Yeah. It's but, sweet. like, once you get into the stuff it's with It's set her in sister, Shanghai in the 30s. Oh, yeah, do we need to contextualize? Right. Yeah, yeah. So, right. Set, set in, in Shanghai, Shanghai in, in the, the 30s. 30s. Boy, meet, boy meets girl, girl meets boy at work. They slowly fall in love. What so. I thought was great about this is this book was written in, like, the 40s, I think. Um, and like, it feels so ahead of its time where like the yes. boyfriend is actually a little more conservative and like, oh, your sister's a prostitute. Like, I don't know how I feel about this. And Manjin is just like, well, like maybe the immoral people are the people going to prostitute. She goes on this whole like rant about it. And I'm like, yes, Eileen Chang, this is so progressive for like the forties, which is wild. Um, yeah. and then there's also some like Jane Eyre, like elements a little bit of the, like someone being locked up. Or whatever. It, I mean, it it takes this turn from yeah, being like kind a of a romance to like some sort of like deeply Extremely dark. messed up. Greek that was based tragedy. on something that happened to Eileen Chang. Horrible things happened. Yeah, horrible to things happened to Man Jin. Man Jin. Yeah. But I like she has like a resilience where there's like a scene where she tries to basically like cut someone with like a broken rice bowl, which I yeah. was like yeah. Good for you. But then also I think the rest of the book captures her like response to trauma really well. Yeah. Like you go through this like incredibly dark section in kind of the middle of the book and it very much primes you for like, I want there to be 
some sort of like bloody revenge mm. like some something very like kind of violent and cathartic as like a follow-on to this yeah. to kind of get past that and it doesn't happen it's yeah. basically the realization of like you can't turn back time yep. and it's just like heartbreaking yep. it's great it is good yes. okay yeah no, it's, i think it's talking very... about it is reminding me why i liked it yeah. so much yeah 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 <sighs> yeah it's just killer and then love in a fallen city i don't so remember good. the details of a lot of those stories i think more in love in a fallen city than in half a lifelong romance where like she will have these little bits of a metaphor going. Mm. Um, like the one that I had scribbled down in my notes is like, um, like Shanghai is being attacked by the Japanese. Mm. There's like an artillery cannon going off, like somebody's shooting somewhere and you can hear the bullets like thumping into the hillside yeah. or whatever. Um, and there's like this line where it's like, oh, the bullets were like tearing the sky. And you're like, okay, great, fine. It's like a little dash of metaphor or whatever, yeah. but then it keeps going and it's like, the bullets are tearing the sky, the like kind of tatters of the sky are like breaking off and flying around in the wind. Oh. And it turns into this thing about like people's nerves are frayed in oh. the same way that the sky is frayed and they're, you know, people are getting like little bits of people's frayed yeah. nerves like caught on them oh, in I the don't wind or whatever. That. So there are just these like little Thanks. flourishes where she kind of takes a metaphor and then like stretches it out a yeah. lot longer than you would expect and sort of twists it into something like weird but really interesting. Yeah. And, you know, there are just a few of these little bits sprinkled throughout these stories, yeah. but they're very like kind of distinct and like startling when you yeah. run into them. Well, and what I remember about her books, I don't remember that specifically, but so much of her language feels like a just like perfectly like cut jewel like a gem like her language yeah. is very glamorous and very kind of like mid-century like cinematic it has this like lush quality but it's also just like these like like it's like a glittering like jewel box kind right. of that also has i guess like what you're saying those yeah. just like little like pieces of metaphor that like make it so such yeah. a pleasure to yeah. read it has a very similar feel to like F. Scott Fitzgerald. Yes. Very gilded yeah. age. Some of this, I think, is because you're talking about like upper crust society in yeah. Shanghai right before. She's talking about World like World lacquered boxes and like jade and all this rich like material. It has a kind of tactile quality. Yeah, but there's also like kind of the. There's sort of the like society drama or like kind of marriage yeah. plot y yeah, dramas totally. that you have totally. in like. Great Gatsby, or even like kind of Jane Austen, Jane Austen maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, Which I think is true to like, she, most of those stories are set in like Shanghai or Hong Kong, right? right? And she captures like the kind of humidity and like the mist and the rain in Hong Kong so well and like mm. the hills. But anyway, yeah, but in that time period, she's writing about like the 30s and 40s in China's very marriage plot heavy. Yeah. But then what's very cool about it too, or I think what, what makes her kind of a great author for people to be sort of rediscovering in 2019 yeah. is that she has like a much more modern perspective on this than yeah. like F. Scott, Fitzgerald F. Scott Fitzgerald or Jane Austen yeah. because there are these like marriage plotty things but then like there's very strong subtexts of like all of this like upper class marriage stuff is like basically high-end prostitution yeah. and yeah. sometimes it just turns into overt prostitution uh -huh. too so there are these like very sharp edges of social commentary mm -hmm. like wrapped up in the kind of glamorous story her books are like these finely cut gems that she'll shank you with the last thing that i thought we would talk about i listed the white book by hong kong as a book that sam read because i told him to and then Which he went whoa, whoa 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 and i was like <laughs> oh sorry so Sam recommended Human Acts to me, which was the first Hong Kong book that I had read. Then I read The Vegetarian, which you've also read. And then I got a copy of The White Book and then lent my copy to him. So he's like, this is technically my recommend, like Sam's recommendation, okay. which fair enough. But yeah. Because Sam's such a book snob that I was a couple of years ago, I was like, okay, like what book do you recommend? Because I think I like gave you Exit West. I put, I didn't put this on the list because you didn't have strong feelings about it, which I at the time loved. And then Sam said, it was good or like twas good or whatever when I texted you what you thought about it and yeah. I was like classic Sam like no response um it was decent it was um, pretty good Sam borrowed my copy of Exit West and returned it with a coffee stain on the cover so Water stain. <laughs> come on still not okay so then I was like what book 
do you actually think is super impressive? And he said, Human Acts is just like the best thing I've read in recent memory, right? Yeah, that was probably the best book that I read in whatever that 2017. was. 2017, yeah. something like that. Yeah. And then I read it, and it's basically a book about the Gwangju uprising in Korea in 1980. And I had not heard about it and didn't know anything about it and, and had never read a book translated from Korean. So it was like opening a whole kind of... It kind of is what got me really into reading more like translated literature and particularly translated mm -hmm. literature from like Korea and Japan and yeah. a little bit China. Yeah. So I mean, um, the... the... The setup is that there's this uprising, mm -hmm. the government kills a bunch of protesters. One of them is this boy. Yeah. Um, the teenager. It's like he gets killed and then there are kind of all of these different little like stories. Like each chapter is a it's story It's like a told. rippling out of like people who were affected by that event. Right. And like each chapter is a different person and it's like farther away in time from that central right. event in the right. 80s. So like the kind of one of the initial chapters is like his I think friend mm -hmm. also who's looking is... for him. Oh no, wait, I was gonna who's say the first chapter. I don't remember the first chapter. This is like but maybe then the, the third... second chapter is like his friend who also has been killed, killed and, and is it's from a... the perspective of his soul. Well, yeah, I mean it's yes, it's from the perspective of his soul while his body is like in a pile of yeah. bodies. Yeah. And like, it's a brutal book. It, like, it's a really yeah. tough read. It's a short book, but it's really tough. Yeah. Um, but there, like, there's just kind of this intensity to that scene where, like, this kid's soul or whatever is kind of looking for his, I think, sister. Yeah. And realizes that she also has been killed. And there's just this, like, outpouring of agony yeah. at the end of that chapter that is... And then it gets into, yeah. like, the people who survived, who were kind of, like, brutalized by the government and tortured. And it's just, like, it's really, right. it's tough. Right. And then the second, the one that really, like, I liked the book, um, but it was a tough read. And it wasn't until the second to last chapter is from the perspective of Dong Ho's mother. Like, right. years after Dong Ho has died. And it's just, like, oh. Yeah waterworks yeah and then the vegetarian is the book that she's most known for and i liked the vegetarian as something to think about i didn't necessarily like reading it but it's I about mean, it's a woman who fun. decides to be a vegetarian and then her family's response to it and it's kind of about like like being a woman in korea and um like mental health and a bunch of other stuff yeah i mean yeah. it's it's basically like a spiral into mental illness fueled yeah. by a bunch of people's inability to like not be awful to you yeah for various yeah. reasons and then the white book is her is hong kong's book about it's kind of experimental it's almost like poetry a little bit and has pictures in the middle and it's about the color white and begins with this idea of hong kong's older sister died a few hours after being born and she kind of meditates on that idea and the fact that if that hadn't happened, she probably wouldn't have been born and then a bunch of yeah. other stuff. So it's kind of talking about like life, death, the transience of all things, but it's so good. I liked it. Not as much as human acts though. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. But anyway, Sam, thank you for joining me today. Did Thanks you have for a having good time? Me. We survived. You actually had good insights. So thank you for sharing. Do you have anything else you want to say before we go? Bye. Bye. Thank you for watching. See you next time. Bye.